Sometimes they come back. Benign farmers, phantom cats, and demons hidden inside boxes. Today's video features five allegedly true and terrifying stories about hauntings, near break-ins, and more that will have you feeling every variety of emotion. So tuck yourself in and turn on the nightlight. It's time for some very scary stories. Want to have your story narrated? Share it with us at darknessprevails.org submit. Or check out darkstories.org to read thousands of scary true stories from other people and to share your own. Now, let's begin. The Farmer from Cyanide Kitty This event spans 14 years of my life. While I was growing up, I had a spirit that basically watched over me while I was at home. Ever since I was a baby, he was always around me. I called him the farmer, but I can't honestly tell you why. The name came to me and just stuck, but I can say that my property used to be a farm and I've found super old and rusted nails and hinges for barn doors in our small horse pasture. These items were always basically made of rust, far too weathered to be from our own tiny barn. Anyway, the farmer always appeared as a shadow on the wall in human form, never a solid mass or mist. However, this shadow would appear and move in places where no one else would be, so it was never anyone else's shadow I was seeing. Sometimes, while I watched TV down in the basement, he would stand behind the couch and me. The hair on the back of my neck would stand on end at the feeling of his presence there, even if I wasn't necessarily scared. It was kind of like how static electricity would make your hair stand on end if you rubbed a balloon on your head. He followed me all throughout the house, but never left the property itself. When I'd go to my room or the bathroom, he would wait outside at the doorway, but he never entered those two rooms. Instead, he would stay in front of the doorway like a sentry, waiting and guarding me. Now, I didn't know he was guarding me for a long time. I simply grew up with him there. It was normal for me, anyway. He never appeared for anyone else but me but he did do things that couldn't easily be explained away that my parents witnessed. One instance was our stove light turning off. I'd been in my room unaware of anything going on outside of the personal space. My parents were in the bathroom, and the stove light in the kitchen was on. However, when exiting the bathroom, they found it to be off, switched off, the knob physically having been turned by someone. They questioned me about it, but I told the truth that it hadn't been me, and I was far too short to reach the light at the time anyway. I'm an only child, and no one else had been in the house to do it. While my mom was in bed one night, her doorknob began to turn. She's an extremely light sleeper, so she woke up to it and watched it turn in the dim light. It just kept turning slowly but it never opened. She thought it was me thinking about coming in at first, maybe to tell her I was sick or something, but when the door never opened, she finally got up and opened it herself, but no one was on the other side. When she checked on me, I was fast asleep in my bed. We also had some outdoor cats that oftentimes came inside. Before anyone says anything, these were strays when we got them and they got extremely stressed when inside for too long, so we'd have to let them out. Still, they're spayed and neutered, and are up to date on their shots even back then. It was a spring or summer day when I was maybe 13, and our cat Daryl comes trotting through the kitchen. The funny thing was, we knew all of our cats had been outside, and my mom and I were the only ones home. We were unpacking groceries in the kitchen, so we definitely had not let the cat in. Yet, somehow the door had opened just long enough to let him inside. Also, it happened without us hearing it, but we were certain 
he had been outside beforehand. When I was 14, the farmer stopped being so frequent at the house and staying with me. One day, I was going down to the basement to watch some TV and relax. However, I didn't make it the whole way down the stairs. I made it to the landing and turned to step down, but I stopped in my tracks. I can honestly say I didn't see anything, but I felt it. Coming from the opposite corner was the strongest sense of hatred and danger I've ever felt in my life, even to this day. It felt like if I took one more step down into the basement, I could die. But I didn't see anything. Then I got another feeling, a much more familiar one, the presence of the farmer standing right in front of me, protecting me from whatever malicious force was in the other corner of the room. Needless to say, I bolted back up the stairs and slammed the basement door shut, even locking it. After that, I stopped seeing or feeling the farmer for a very long time. Years passed without anything. I fully believe he was my guardian angel of some sort. Maybe he was a farmer who died on the field my house was built on. Maybe he was such a good soul and turned out to be my angel. Every now and then, my family and I experience different paranormal events. They're small things, though. We're pretty sure we have a couple of new spirits that stick around, and some that have just passed through. But every now and then, I like to think the farmer managed to come back for visits, to check up on me, and to make sure I'm doing all right. My Ghost Cat, from Princessa Wolf, 1920. A few years back, I lived in a little apartment not far from where I am now, with my now ex-husband and our then year-and-a-half-old son. Now, I've always loved cats, always will, but back then my ex who hated cats refused to allow one in the house, no matter how much I pleaded. One day, we were just lounging around, and for a split second, we saw this black and white cat clawing at our curtains. I got a good enough look before it vanished to see it was a long-haired cat, but then it was gone. Fast forward a few days, and we're sitting down to dinner. Suddenly, I feel something rub against my legs. I look down, and I see a fluffy black tail with a white tip disappear under the table. This ghost cat clearly wanted someone to see it. Well, I definitely saw it. Sometime after this, my brother visited us, and in the middle of our conversation, he asked, So, when would you guys get a cat? My ex replied, saying that we don't have one. The look on his face went from fine to confused. Then he asked, Well, whose cat did I just see running around the table? My jaw dropped. I looked at my brother and said, Was it black and white with a white-tipped black tail? He nodded, and I flipped out. I told him that wasn't our cat, per se, but it was a ghost cat that's been wandering around the apartment. He freaked out, too, and not long after that, he left. I don't see why he was so scared of it. I thought it was a great thing to have around. Soon December rolled around, and by then my ex got custody of his other son, and his mother had come to see her grandkids for a Christmas visit. As she's unpacking some gifts to put under the tree, she hands my ex a box that is lower on one side, with an opening on that side. Her husband suggested that we keep it for the cat to play with. I didn't hear him properly, and thought that he meant their cat. I told him that we didn't have one. What he said next just confirmed everything for me, again. No, I meant that strange cat that's been running around here. After this, we began discussing all the stuff that's happened up until then, and his mother laughed at us, thinking we're crazy. She never did believe in the paranormal, not believing us, even after we mentioned that my brother had seen it too. 
despite us never mentioning it beforehand. I saw this phantom cat many times since then, and it has followed me to every place I've lived since then. I've come to call him, as I get the impression that it's a boy, Spectre. Last night, he perched himself on the back of my chair just over my shoulder. He's a comforting presence, and will probably be the only ghost aside from departed family that I don't mind having around. Oftentimes, I wonder if this is what people mean by spirit animal. Sure, this story isn't scary, but it's paranormal, and it's pretty cool in my opinion. The Dybbuk Box, from Dave. I was 12 years old. Me and two of my friends, James and Peter, went to investigate a mysterious house in our hometown. It was a two-story building, and it looked like it had gone through World War II. The place was wrecked, and you had to look out for falling bricks or pieces of wood. Being reckless kids, we decided to go in and explore. The whole house looked a wreck, but there was this one room that caught our attention. The place looked like it had been recently remodeled a bit, which surprised us given the outside look. James said that he was going to check the room out. Peter and I shrugged and went into a freaky looking room covered with spider webs. We found a lot of interesting things in there, bullet casings, smashed pottery, and even a small handgun, which I'm sure we shouldn't have had. We were quite excited and went to show James our treasures. When we entered the room he was in, we saw James standing over something which looked like a small black box. He was murmuring something under his breath. I swear I heard him say something like, He has arrived, and... I will obey you for all my life. What's wrong with you? Peter shouted at him. At that moment, James looked up at us and said, I found an interesting thing. You guys should come see this. I raised an eyebrow and asked him, Is someone over there, dude? I could see the confusion growing on his face. What are you talking about, Jason? He asked. Peter and I exchanged confused glances. Then we went up to James to see what he found. It was a small black box, which seemed to be covered in wax, and it had a pentagram on the top. Later that day, James got a call from his mother, saying that she had to get something done. So I said that since my parents were gone for the weekend, they could come on over for a sleepover. We went to my place, and we watched a movie and ordered a pizza. Suddenly, we heard something shatter, followed by odd whispering and banging sounds. The three of us ran into the kitchen, but nothing was broken. The only weird thing was that the box was now on the floor, even though James had placed it on the table. Later, we decided that we wanted to go to bed, but in the middle of the night... We were awakened by some eerie footsteps. When I opened my eyes, I saw this figure standing over James. I could only make out an outline in the dark, but I swear the thing had horns on top of its head. It leaned down close to James's sleeping form, and it said something in a low, gravelly voice. I was paralyzed with fear. Then, the creature or figure screamed, jumping through the open window. The sound of its scream caused James and Peter to wake up. James panicked and looked over next to the bed, then gasped because the box he had found was now open, despite trying and failing to open it the entire night. Peter sprang out of his bed and chucked it out the window. It's been two years since that event happened, but having seen similar movies about haunted items, I'm scared that one day it will come back, that we'll find it in one of our rooms just laying there. Maybe I'm just traumatized. The 
Big Eyes from XX Rowdy XX. I was 15 years old. Back then, I had this odd fear of overly big eyes. Too wide, too big, or otherwise, they creeped me out. When I was 15, I obviously had chores like every teenager did. One of my chores every now and again was to mow the grass. I lived in Cincinnati, so in the summer it was extremely humid. On this particular day, I was mowing the grass. I had some shorts on and a crop top. I mowed the front and that was that. At the time, I lived off an extremely busy street that ran through my little town. A couple of weeks later, my mom and dad decided to sell the boat we had sitting in our driveway. I lived in a little town about 35 minutes from downtown Cincinnati, and it was in Claremont County. On the day this all happened, it was just my mom, my little sister, who was six at the time, and myself. My dog was there too, but she was a miniature pincher, so her bark was bigger than her bite. It wasn't her fault. She was only six pounds. Anyway, I hear my mom shouting for me, asking if I knew who drove the red truck that just pulled into the driveway. I told her I didn't know. She says maybe he's here about the boat. So she and I are looking out the door window. We had one of those wooden doors with glass on top. So while we could see out, someone outside could see in just as easily. We were watching, and this man wasn't moving. He was staring straight ahead and began revving the engine to his truck like he was threatening to ram through the family room bay window. My mom knew something wasn't right here. She stepped outside onto our porch, staying very close to the door, yelling out to him, Excuse me, sir, can we help you with anything? Are you interested in the boat? The man begins revving the engine again, louder than before. My mom quickly grabs my sister and I and puts us in our bedroom, telling me to lock the doors and not to come out, no matter what. I grab our little dog, holding it, sitting close to my sister. Then I remember that the office sliding doors are all open and unlocked, and only the screen doors are closed. My mom had an extension built on the house as a home office, because she was a realtor. I began to think, with so many open ways, my mom can't do this alone. I opened my bedroom window, which led into the backyard, which had a huge privacy fence, so I knew my sister would be safe with the windows open. I put my deck chair up against the window, told her to lock the doors if I'm not back in five minutes, and if worse comes to worst, to go out the window and to crawl through the little opening at the very back of the yard. That would lead to the neighbors, where she could call 911. I gave her a hug, and I smiled, telling her everything would be okay. I peek around the corner into the living room, and I see my mom pushing on the front door with a shotgun, and this man has his face pressed up against the glass. My breath runs short. The man's eyes. They were huge. Wide. Crazy looking. It instantly freaked me out. I began the army crawl through the living room past the door so he couldn't see me, and so that I didn't distract my mom. Now, my dad was a collector of World War stuff and kept them on the bookshelf by the kitchen and dining room. I grabbed the bayonet off the bookshelf and continued to army crawl to the office. I quickly shut and locked all the sliding glass doors, so the only way the man could get in was through the front door. Once I had the office secured, I quickly dialed 911, and I went over to the door where the man was, and I began to help her push on the door, looking at his huge, crazy pair of eyes. I yell at him, telling him that the police are coming. He grimaces, then he quickly goes back to his truck. My mom gets the door secured, and then we hear the revving of the engine, only this time it's more aggressive and extreme. I prayed that he doesn't try to ram the house. I hand my mom the phone and go running to my room. I knock and tell my sister to open the door. It takes her a minute, but she unlocks it. 
The man ended up not actually ramming into the house, thank God. And luckily, his lips and nose prints remained on the front door on the glass part. The police arrived, and we explained what he was driving and what he looked like. I'd gotten his plate number too. They found him ten minutes later up the street at a gold star. It took six police officers to take him down and into custody. He claimed to have an epileptic seizure and had no memory of what had happened, but I'm calling BS on that. Turns out what really caused this random big-eyed psycho to try to break into the house was a few days previous, he saw me outside mowing grass and my mom working on the flower bed, and he thought we were very attractive. I lived in a pretty small place in Claremont County growing up, so I would see him around from time to time. His family had money, so he got off pretty easily given what he did. Whenever I'd see him, which was mainly where I worked, I would go in the back of the store and stay there until he left. So to the man whose name I can't put here, who caused me to literally be terrified of big eyes, let's never ever meet again. Women in White from Dr. White Rabbit I've heard many stories of women in white roaming along roads, crossing highways at night, but I had never encountered one myself. I had heard stories of them specifically around South Africa, one day, I caught wind of a rather eerie sighting up the road from me. Having heard the stories before, I thought, to heck with it. My ex-wife had just left me, so I was feeling reckless. I jumped on my bike, and I set off. I reached that stretch of road. In the distance, I can hear the lions and zebra at the nearby rhino park. I slowly rolled down the road keeping my eye out for anything weird, hoping that I would see something. But I saw nothing. I drive home unsatisfied. A few months later, I got a bit of an origin story for this supposed ghost, though I hadn't seen it. Apparently, there had been a motorcycle accident where a boyfriend had tossed off his girlfriend from the back of the bike Having found out that she was cheating on him, she didn't make it. Again, I wasn't sure if I believed all this. One day, my friend Robert phones me up. He tells me, listen dude, you won't believe what happened to Matt. What happened, I asked. He was going down that corner you've been riding around every Friday. Over the radio, he says he sees a woman. You're kidding me, I reply. So she's there. Yeah, she is, he answers. Fantastic. Just as I was starting to believe it was just a legend, my interest is peaked once again. So off I went. Twenty minutes later, I reached the crash site. I stopped there and waited. Eventually, I began calling out for someone, anyone. This time around, my nerves began to act up. I felt creeped out as if I wasn't alone. I called out again, letting her know that she could rest in peace now, that it was over, that there was no more pain to be had. There was no response yet, just the sound of cicadas and lions. I tried calling once more. I know you're here, I said. You can leave. It's okay. Still, in the distance, it was just lions, but a cold sweat was forming on my skin. Something didn't feel right. I need to get out of here, I said. So I get on my bike, and I begin to drive away. But then it starts misfiring, and I slow down to a stop. I take this as a sign. Chills flow over my spine, as I hear a soft voice on the wind. But I can't tell what it's saying. I slowly start walking towards the sound. I stop, and I say to myself, what am I doing? So I start to head back to my bike, but just as I make it back to it, I notice that it's idling smoothly now. I put my helmet back on and slowly pull away. 
Then I glance in the mirror, and there she is. A woman in white. She's standing in the bushes on the side of the road, and I swear she was smiling. Before I could turn around, she had already faded away. To date, not a single biker has crashed on that corner. Not another person has seen her, and I feel that she has left and is at long last resting. Keep your friends close, your family and ghost cats closer, because this world is full of creeps that, even after they die, feel like coming back to keep on haunting you. But don't worry, because once you die, you can just haunt them right back. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode of Darkness Prevails, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you have a story you want to share with the world, and possibly have me narrate it, share it with us at darkstories.org or darknessprevails.org slash submit. If you want to support the show, check the links below. There's a link to my Patreon, where you get access to these episodes as ad-free MP3s, and you usually get them early. And there's a link to my merch store, where you can get shirts with creepy monsters on them, or my slogan. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous episode, titled, I was raised in rural Korea, and I saw some disturbing things. Jay An says, Finally, something about South Korea. Well, with my sister nonstop talking about BTS, it was only a matter of time before I talked about the creepy things that go down in Korea. Maybe that will calm her down a bit. Tiny Reese's says, Spoopy month is over, but the spooks never stop when you're subscribed to darkness. Oh yeah, year-round we're getting terrified, so be sure to subscribe and stay notified so that you don't miss your regularly scheduled nightmares. Lil Alaku says, Thumbnail. Sea King, is that you? Well, considering he got disintegrated, dominated, and absolutely wrecked by one punch man as an afterthought, it could be one of his offspring or cousins. But with Caped Baldy still on the loose, I wouldn't be showing my fish face up here. Winchester559 says, I'm in Korea, and I want to see these things. Well, if you manage to survive an encounter, Send me one of those spooky spirit monsters in the mail, so I can raise it to be super cute, and I can put little costumes on it during Halloween. And Angelus USA says, That's it. I'm gonna get me mallet. The longest time I would run Courage the Cowardly Dog episodes on the other monitor as I record it. I'm always wondering if what I'm listening to in my headphones sometimes leaks out into the mic. So if you hear a random ooga booga booga, it's probably Courage the Cowardly Dog. Well, that brings us to the end of this Darkness Prevails episode. But don't worry, more scary stories are coming soon, so stay tuned. Also, let me know in the comments what stories you want to hear next. I've been doing this so long that it's hard to come up with new ideas. I think my creativity has taken a big hit. Well, until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons that continue to donate. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.